Let's pretend you and I, one-on-one, -on -one, are going out to lunch today, and you're telling me something at lunch today that's important to you, a struggle you're having or something here at work, and I'm listening to you, and you're feeling heard. In fact, you leave lunch and you say to yourself, man, Mike really listened to me today. I felt cared about. Okay? I want you to write down everything I must have been doing that gave you that impression. Talk about that with your coworkers here. What was I doing that gave you this impression that I was listening and that I was hearing you and that I cared? Make a list. I heard someone say, pay for lunch. No, I'm not paying for your lunch. I'm not buying your love. Sorry. All right, let's, let's just kind of randomly list these and I'm going to show you a concept that puts these all together. So just, just shout them out. What, what was I doing that caused you to feel listened to? Made eye contact. Eye contact. What else? Shy expression. Some emotion, some emotional response. Asking questions. Asking good questions. Not multitasking. Not doing other things. Didn't rush to a solution. Didn't try to fix you. Body language. Other body language, like, give me one. Nodding. Nodding. Gestures. Good. What else? Avoided distractions. Yep. Cell phones. Are on. Yep. Didn't flip the conversation back on to you. Oh, that reminds me of me. <laughs> Let me tell you about me. Good. Not interrupting. You guys have nailed these. Let's do them together here. Next page. Listening in eight component parts. Now, let me give you the context here, guys. I want you to be listening sort of double duty, listen in stereo, because not only am I wanting you to hear this piece right now as a learning component for your management, I also want you to recognize that I'm showing you how to break a skill down into its component parts, right? We're taking the adaptive skill, the behavior aspect of it, breaking it down to parts, because you can't just go, be a better listener, be a better listener. That doesn't make sense, and that tends to wear us out, and it tends to lead to failure. Instead, you have to break the skill down into its parts. Now, for you guys, I want you to be practicing this skill. What you'll hear us talk about on day two, did you know that about 30% of the population out there naturally does these skills without even having to try. Do the math. Do the math. That means 70% of us, 70% of us actually are going to have to get these component parts in our brains and consciously, intentionally practice them, right? So let's walk through these. The first one is all about body language. I'm not going to list all of the components except for this one. Yes, eye contact. How many of you said eye contact at your table? I'm sure everybody said that, right? Now, can we agree that every one of these skills can be overdone? Because oh, yeah. I don't want you listening to me like this. Because that's just <laughs> kind of creepy, right? Every one of these skills can be done poorly or done overly, right? So we're talking about general eye contact, right? What else, body language-wise? Give me some examples of what it says here. Attentive postures, gestures, and facial expressions. A little bit of nodding. Now again, I don't want a bobblehead, right? If you're doing this the whole time, it loses its meaning and it's annoying, right? But uh, the well-placed head nod communicates what message? I'm tracking. Right? What you're actually saying there by the head nod is that thing you just said, I'm tracking and I might even be relating, right? Tracking and relating. Other body language? Um, open posture. Open posture. Not looking closed and not scowling. Now, uh, uh, there's a concept called mirroring. Have you heard of that? Um, it's not mimicking. When they scratch their cheek, you scratch your cheek. That's really <laughs> creepy. And you could really wig someone out over time by doing that to them, right? Um, but, it's, but it's a general body posture mirroring. So if they're sitting back on the couch, lounging and chatting, then go ahead and lounge and chat, right? If they're sitting up, sit up. If they're facing at an angle toward you, it's okay for you to be at an angle toward them. It's it just kind of mirror. That's, that's the body language positioning piece. There's facial expressions. You're going to hear about this on day two. Did you know that half the population has what we call a rather non-demonstrative face? And the other half of the population has a demonstrative face. Which do I have, do you think? You, you see my face changing a lot? Mm -hmm. So I married someone who's not demonstrative, right? 
Um, now I know her for 30 something years, right? So I know that when she moves her eyebrow one millimeter, I know exactly what that means, right? <laughs> so so it, it works, right? But um, uh, people that have a less demonstrative face, they have trouble being read. People don't read them accurately. In fact, sometimes people think they're mad. People think they're mad, people think they don't like them, people think they don't care, people think they're not listening. Because people who have very non-demonstrative faces, they don't recognize that they're not giving facial cues. Right? And so it's a little bit of a, tiny bit more of an uphill battle for that person to practice some of the facial expressions. And so on behavior styles, day two, we're gonna be digging into some of these differences. Good. Number two. Shh. And we mean this in two different ways. Don't interrupt. What they found is the first time you interrupt somebody in that conversation, their brain registers it as a, as a one-off. No big deal. The second time you interrupt them in that same conversation, their brain registers it as a yellow warning light. And the third time you interrupt them in that same conversation, their brain goes into, okay, I get it. And again, this is often very subconscious for them. Um, you think that what you have to say is more important than what I have to say. And that's right next door to you think you're more important than me. Right? So interrupting is a message. It's not a respectful message. Right? And the other part of shh is watch your airtime, which is where I would include don't turn the conversation back to yourself. Now, there's nothing wrong with using yourself as a reference point and relating, using a story. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's more about airtime. How much time are you spending in that conversation talking? Okay. Number three, paraphrase. Paraphrase is not the same thing as parroting. I, I remember back in junior college, I had this friend and she took a communications class and apparently she learned how to paraphrase, but not very well. <laughs> we would like, we'd go, I mean, I remember we were out eating one time and I said something about, you know, the food and she goes, I hear you saying you like your salad. Yes, I just said that. <laughs> you don't, that's, that's not paraphrasing. Paraphrasing is, um, first of all, it's most often um, not a parroting, it's a rephrasing. Right? It's, it's saying what they said in different word, and in different words and it's sort of checking in. Right? It can be literally a question. Oh, oh, are you saying that you felt this way? So there's, you know, taking something they said, kind of changing the words around and asking. So that, there's a paraphrase mixed in with a question. Sometimes it could just be a statement, right? Oh, oh yeah, you're feeling, you're feeling super frustrated about that. Now, they didn't say, I'm frustrated, because that would be weird if they said, I'm frustrated, and you said, you're feeling frustrated. Well, yeah, I just said that. But they said something that approximated that, and you summed it up and threw it back at them. That, what they've done in studies, it shows that when that person is being listened to with paraphrasing, it dramatically increases their sense of being heard. Because what it shows is the other person is actually working at trying to understand them. So that's paraphrasing. Any questions about that one? Asking questions. I've got a high school friend who comes through Leavenworth about once a year around the holidays, and we get together for a beer, and we talk about him for two hours. Every time. We talk about his life, his kids, his family, his, uh, his, his job. Um, we don't talk about my job or my kids or my life. Because why? He never asks a question. He doesn't ask questions. I ask questions and he doesn't. He buys the beer, so I show up. <laughs> Avoid distractions. You, you mentioned this earlier, right? Put away your phone or whatever it is that you think you can multitask with. Um... Empathetic reflection. Um, somebody over here mentioned the feelings. This is actually a, a really important piece, and it's not the same thing as paraphrasing. Paraphrasing is indicating to the other person that you're tracking their content, and empathetic reflection is indicating that you get what they're experiencing. So this can be as simple as a noise. Oh, if you're good at that sort of thing. Some people aren't, so don't try it, but if you're good at it, you know, oh. Or it could be a phrase, oh, I'm sorry. Or it could be that, and that, that must have been really exciting. Wow, that's cool, good for you. I mean, it's really simple, really. We probably do it naturally. Uh, at least some people do. Some people don't. And this is a, a deeper kind of listening. You're really showing the person at that point that you're at least attempting to get into their movie right now, right? You're, you're, you're trying to experience or, or understand what they're experiencing. It's said that um, empathy is an exercise in imagination, right? We don't really know what somebody else is feeling but we can approximate, we can imagine. And so this is your attempt to kind of show them 
that you're um, imagining what's happening for them. Uh, don't be a fixer. I like that somebody said this earlier. Anyone ever talk to that person who immediately has an answer every single time? I, I, I'm not saying, guys, I'm not saying don't ever offer a solution. That's, that none of this is black and white. In fact, all of these can be overdone. All of these can be taken too rigidly. But the person who constantly has a book you should read, has a podcast you should listen to, has a supplement you should take, and in fact they happen to sell it. No, just kidding. They, um, here's what you should do. You know, what, what tends to ha uh, happen for the person on the receiving end of that, if that's your constant mode, is they don't feel respected. It feels like you're trying to be efficient with them. What's often happening, by the way, for the person who's the fixer, they're not comfortable with their own uncomfortable feelings that they're having with you right now. They, they're feeling empathy, probably. And they don't want to feel the uncomfortableness anymore, so they want you to get fixed. And they're also kind people. I'm not trying to say these are bad people at all, right? But they don't understand that that doesn't really look like listening. Now, if I come back to you a week later, number eight here, check back later, I see you next week in class, and I say to you, hey, how'd that difficult conversation go? that you had to have with your boss. How'd that go? What two things have I just communicated to you? You know, the times that you heard them. And I listened. And you remembered. I, okay, I listened, I remembered, and that tells you that I, care. I cared, care. right? Mm -hmm. I, I heard you, and I care, right? That's just a really cool way to communicate both of those afterwards. Now, here's a question. Let's say we had lunch today. I was getting an A- minus or a B plus in this stuff. The rhetorical question first is, are you going to feel heard? That's rhetorical, which means the answer is yes. Right? You certainly are. Right? If I'm getting an A minus at, or B plus at worst, right, you're going to feel heard, right? meaning I'm doing these pretty well. You're going to feel heard. That's just no doubt. Here's the deeper question. Am I listening? Am I actually listening, or am I just putting on a bunch of behaviors? What do you guys think? You think I'm actually listening? Yeah, you have to. If you're doing these things, like, you have to pay attention. Yeah. That's, it, it, here's the really cool thing about the behavioral aspect of adaptive skills. Quite often, when you put on the behaviors, it makes you do the thing. Right? I mean, how could I even do half those things at an A-plus or, or B-plus level, right, if I wasn't listening? Some of the, many of those things you just can't do unless you're listening. So the cool thing is, often doing the behaviors themselves make you do the thing. Now, here's a really quick question at your table, and bottom of your page there, right? Don't write these in yet, but what am I doing internally, right? So I just we just listed eight things that I'd be doing externally. What do you think I'm doing internally that's helping me to be a better listener? So I'm going I'm to give you literally like a minute at your table on that one. So talk to your coworkers there. That's all you get. What'd you, what'd you come up with? What, what might you be doing? What might I be doing internally so that I'm not just putting on the behaviors, but I'm also internally becoming a better listener? What am I doing internally? Self-checking. Self-checking what? What am I checking? You're basically everything. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. So monitoring all that stuff. Good, good. So, so I'm, okay, in fact, I don't have that up here, but that's, that's actually the first thing, right? I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on those eight behaviors. Like that in and of itself. In fact, I do have that up there. There's two, there's two versions of this word then. You guys all have focus, right? Something like that, right? I'm focusing on two things, right? First thing I'm focusing on, or at least one of the things I'm focusing on, is making sure I'm doing these things. What else am I focusing on? What they're saying, right? I'm, I'm really working on tracking. Um, I was with a client, and this is kind of funny because this is actually a coaching client. I am literally being paid to listen, okay? So I was with this client, this was about six months ago. Right in the middle of what he was saying to me, my mind just went. And I, I had just, I'm catching up on Games of, Game of Thrones, and I had just watched this, one of my favorite episodes the night before. I swear, I went to Dragons for like a minute. <laughs> a full minute of I just went to this dragon that got shot and died, and I'm like, whoa. And I, I, I'm, listen, I'm thinking about this for a full minute, completely not hearing anything he said. Now, focus, of course, is coming back. And I want to make sure you hear this. The, the, the failure isn't that you wandered away as much as you didn't come back, right? He counted as a success. Every time you come back, come back every time. Now, you actually have two choices when you come back. Meaning, you could say what I said, 
Hey, I'm so sorry, I missed the last statement. Could you just repeat that? Now, do you see that's actually kind of honoring, right? And unless you do that all the whole conversation. If I do that like 20 times, it's like, okay, why am I paying you, right? But, but for me to say, hey, I missed, I, my mind wandered. I, now, I don't have to say dragons, right? That's just weird. That would just be weird, right? But, but, I, but, but sorry, I started thinking about dragons as you were talking. They're like, what? Right? But to say something like, hey, I'm really sorry my mind wandered, that's actually really honoring for the other person, right? Now, my other choice is to do what? Pretend. Just pretend. Just come back and just go, oh my God, what? Okay, what? what? Oh, got it. You know, just catch up. <laughs> don't, just don't let on. Just don't let on, right? What else? What else am I doing internally? Anything else you're doing to help you be a better listener? Yep, absolutely. It's another third one I have up here. Practice empathy, right? Why you're listening, you're putting yourself in their movie, right? They're telling you something. So imagine life from that vantage point, right? As you're telling them some, as they're telling you something, imagine life from their vantage point. And that second one up there is again that's adaptive skill we mentioned earlier. Practice being curious as opposed to judgy. Now you put those three things on internally, and you do these things. Oops, I went the wrong way. And you do these things. Okay, they're they're in there somewhere. Where are they? Here we go, right? Now, here's the thing, guys, and I'm going to give you a stretch break in a minute because we've got a really important piece up until noon, but listen carefully, guys. Um, if you're one of the people in this room who is not in the 30% that automatically does all this stuff, okay, if you're in the 70%, um, I'm going to challenge you with this. First of all, do you agree with me that this is an important skill for a leader? Yes. For a manager? It, it absolutely is. Um, this is not to imply that you have to listen, by the way. Right? Is it okay to be busy? Too, too busy to listen? Right? It's totally okay to say, hey, I'm sorry, it's not a good time. Can we... Okay, this is not... I, I just have to say that because I've had a couple of people who misinterpreted this that they thought this meant you always have to be geared up and ready for this. No. All we're saying is when you choose to listen, you have to listen like this. Um, there's memory work attached to learning these adaptive skills because the only thing that makes these click is when you get to this phase. Unconscious competence, the only way you're gonna get there is by focusing on conscious competence over and over and over and over again. Here's my analogy. I'm a musician, I play the piano. When I've just learned a new song, and I've got it down, but I just learned it, and I'm still using the music, and every note on the music corresponds to every key and every finger, right? And I'm, if it's a longer song, I'm actually tired afterwards because I had to concentrate so hard, and I can't let my mind wander. Now, the more I play it, and the more I play it, and the more I play it, pretty soon, right, I'm not looking at the music so much. Um, I can let my mind wander a little bit, and my mind comes back, and I'm still playing. Um, like that day when you drove somewhere and couldn't remember how you got there, right? <laughs> um, I can improvise a little bit. Now, the, what got me there was the magic word. What's the word? Practice. Practice. That's where you get to the point where your muscle memory changes, your habits change, and you literally grow gray matter. Your neural pathways adjust. But the only way you're going to get there, and I know this is obvious, is by really focusing on this piece right here. And the only way you're going to do that is to have these things in your head. You're going to have to know what those behaviors are so that you can consciously practice them. So guys, uh, bottom line, growing your adaptive skills takes work. That's why that phase, the blue box there, is often called the work phase. It really does take effort. Final thought on listening. Did you know that you can listen well to somebody that you don't want to listen to? Right? You're doing it right now. <laughs> okay, right, right. right? <laughs> Smart asses. But right? You, of course you can, right? Did you know that you can listen well to someone that you don't respect? Of course you can, right? Can you listen well to someone that you don't like very well? Of course you can. 